I mean, there was no clear evidence of, of executions. I mean, you could tell that these were being killed in battle. There were horses that had been shot, some that looked like they had been partially butchered. I think the assumption was the Taliban may have been living off the horse meat. Uh, I even saw a horse that was still alive with a broken leg there. I mean, it was, it was really uh, brutal, brutal. That fight was brutal. That fight was brutal. Now this is typical Afghan, when they come out of the fighting, it doesn't matter what's going on, they just eat, they want their picture taken. And if they had a teapot, they would invite you to tea, you know, it's, it's... <laughs> They're such nice people. At 2 a.m., you could hear this armored column rumble through town, and so I went out to the balcony where I was staying, and it was Dostum arriving from Kunduz. He, in fact, Dostum was gone the entire battle of Kalajungi. And they were not happy that this was going on. That's Dostum as most people know him, you know, with the big Till of the Hun look. That's Fan's pickup. Michael's Fan's pickup from the first day. Some of these bodies have been there for five days. And the smell was absolutely uh, unbelievable. What's the smell like? I guess a combination of sort of stale milk, cheese, stink of excreta, really, uh, catches at the back of your throat. It's quite difficult to eat food for a long while after this. There was so much shooting that all the branches had fallen off and covered the ground like a carpet. Three health officials started linking their way down the stairs of the pink house to go into the cell complex below, and they were shot. One never returned. And at that point, I guess they realized we have Taliban are still willing to fight down in the basement. The reason he showed up was to actually bring the mullahs there and to say, look, look what your people have done. And then hopefully to get them to call up the remaining fighters that were still in the bunker. He was most upset because their people had shown such discourtesy. So in the big picture, he did the right thing, but they had absolutely no way of dealing with this uprising. <laughs> The mullahs were asked to sort of yell down and say, please give up, brothers, you know, it's over, don't, don't kill anyone. And what was the response? <laughs> True to the Talib tradition, they said, no, we don't know those people, <laughs> so it didn't bother. He was disappointed, obviously, because his, his deal had gone sour, but he was really enraged. And he tried to say, you know, I, can't, I don't understand why they did this, because we offered them food, we offered them a deal, and they didn't respect your deal, but you could tell that inside himself, he was really, really mad. When I interviewed them, they were just really unrepentant about anything. They just said, we fought for an idea, and we didn't win. It was as simple as that. And that was basically how they summed up the whole Talib movement. You know, betrayal, deception, this is, these are rules of war. They took the warheads off the rocket launchers, RPGs, and basically were throwing the warheads down, and you could hear them much blowing up. When you see the result of what happened, it is pretty shocking, but you also have to never, never, never forget what brought them there that particular battle at Kalai Jangi. They chose to, 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 to fight. The prisoners chose to fight. I mean, Friday they started pumping water. You know, it was quite cold in the Tsar at this time. And it was cold water. And they didn't know how many Taliban were there. Come Saturday, you know, I mean, this, this is a week now. And the water up to the rain, that's why they had to come out. 